The subject that we're going to take up this morning is refuting universalism. What is universalism? Universalism is the idea that everyone ends up saved, that ultimately no one is lost. There is no one that goes to the lake of fire for eternity. There's zero people that go there. Everyone ends up saved. Now, when I say that, your reaction may be, well, that's, that's kind of crazy talk. And yes, it is. Uh, but it's, it's one of those things that circulates that there are people that, that teach this and that promote this. And so it seems appropriate to evaluate it Test it against the Scriptures. Is it true? Is it false? What do the Scriptures have to say about it? So there's, there's two sections that I want to cover this morning, and the first is this. We will evaluate common arguments used for universalism. In other words, these are arguments that people use to teach that everyone will ultimately be saved. So we'll look at those common arguments. And then the second thing we'll do is we'll have a section on heresies, why they, their, their need for existing, and what it tells you about who is approved and who is not. So two big sections. So let's start with the first section. Eva we're going to evaluate four common arguments for universalism. In other words, these are arguments that people that believe universalism, it's arguments they use. Here's the first argument. God is love. And therefore, God wouldn't send people to hell. Look with me at 1 John 4, verse 8. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 8. 1 John 4, 8. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. So when someone says, God is love, and therefore... He wouldn't send anyone to hell for eternity. Well, it's a true statement that God is love. But what's wrong with that argument? Love is not all that God is. It is true that God is love, but that is not all that He is. Look with me at Deuteronomy 6, verse 15. Deuteronomy chapter 6, Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 15. For the Lord thy God is a jealous God among you, lest the anger of the Lord thy God be kindled against thee and destroy thee from off the face of the earth. So while God is a God of love, he's also a jealous God and he's willing to do what? to destroy people from off the face of the earth. Romans 12, verse 19. Romans chapter 12 and verse 19. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. One of the things, do you need to get personal revenge in your life when people wrong you? And the answer is you don't have to, and you shouldn't. Because how, does, how do things actually work? God says that he is, and let's just notice it again, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. So does God have vengeance? Does God cause repayment to occur? The answer is he does. Get Isaiah 45, verse 21. Isaiah 45 and verse 21. Tell ye and bring them near. Yea, let them take counsel together. Who hath declared this from ancient time? Who hath told it from that time? Have not I the Lord, and there is no God else beside me? A just God and a Savior, there is none beside me. 
Now that verse is helpful because it tells you something about God's character. It says there He is a just God and a Savior. So is, is God a Savior? Does He provide for man's sins? Yes. But what is He at the very same time? He is a just God. Does God have standards of righteousness and holiness that He requires? And the answer is He does. Get Matthew 25 verse 40. Matthew chapter 25 verse 40. Matthew 25, verse 40, And the capital K king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. The capital K king there in Matthew 25, verse 40 is a reference to Jesus Christ. Now notice verse 41, Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, Ye cursed into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. The Lord Jesus Christ specifically describes there him telling people to depart into everlasting fire. Does God send people to hell? Yes, he does. How long does it last? It lasts forever. So let me sum it up by saying this. If your argument is that God is a God of love, and therefore he wouldn't send people to hell, then the God you're talking about is not the God of the Bible. Because the God of the Bible is a jealous God. He's a God that says, vengeance is mine, I will repay. He's a God that prepared hell for the devil and his angels and tells people to depart there. If you believe God wouldn't send people to hell, then your God is Santa Claus. It's a figment of your own imagination. It's not something that you would find in the Scriptures. And just in case we're unclear on this, Santa Claus isn't real. And, and the God that you imagine that won't send people to hell, He's not real either. He's just not. Let's look at the second argument. This is, the, these are arguments that, that universalists use. Here's the second one. The only reason people believe hell is eternal is because of Augustine. Before Augustine, people thought punishment was not eternal. Now, in case you're not familiar with Augustine, Augustine is sometimes called Augustine of Hippo. He was a very famous theologian, and he lived in the 4th century. And so the argument that the Universalists make is they say, well, here's what's actually going on. When, August, uh, when Augustine wrote, he described hell as eternal. But before that, before he wrote, everyone thought that punishment wasn't eternal. It just lasted for a little time. So really what happens is when you say hell is eternal, you're just quoting Augustine whether you know it or not. Augustine was born in 354 A.D., which means the last book of the New Testament was written 250 years before Augustine was born. So what we're going to do next is this. We're going to look at a bunch of verses, and I want you to then tell me, do people believe hell is eternal because of what Augustine says, or do they believe hell is eternal because there were verses they read that were hundreds of years before Augustine even came into existence? So look with me at Mark 9, verse 43. Mark chapter 9 Verse 43. And if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell, notice, into the fire that shall never be quenched, where the worm, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Verse 45. And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter halt into life than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that shall never be quenched. Where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. And if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye, than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. Where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Now what happens in modern versions, if you look at verses 46 and 48, you can see how they're the exact same as verse 44. 
So what modern textual theory does is it looks at those verses and says, well, that's a scribal error. The person was copying it and they weren't paying attention. And so they copied verse 44 two additional times. So we're going to leave them out. It's nice if you have a job where you can just make stuff up. Wouldn't that be easy? Is it that that is a scribal error that was perpetuated for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years? Is that the explanation? Or is it possibly the explanation that the Lord Jesus Christ was aware of eternal hell fire that is unbearable, and that the loving thing to do was to repeat for emphasis. Don't you do that? When you are communicating with someone, and a lot of things we say are of lesser importance, but when there's something of grave importance, do you repeat yourself for emphasis, for clarity, to make sure that it's not missed? Well, that's what's going on there. There are literally six times in 43, 44, 45, 46, 47, 48, where it talks about the fire that shall never be quenched, that it's not quenched. Well, are those copyist errors, or is God trying to get across, look, by the way, did he know there would be people that would deny hell? Yes. So might he have repeated it to make the point, there's going to be people that deny what I'm saying, and they're going to say that Hell actually in the original Greek means tropical paradise. And they're going to make stuff up. And so I'm going to repeat this multiple times to make sure you get it. Get with me, 2 Thessalonians 1. Now when we were looking about the verses about God being a, a God of vengeance that will repay and so on, that vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. There were a bunch of other verses that we could have looked at that we didn't, and we're just going to be constrained by, by time. But I would encourage you that if, to look into these things and, and do the study because there is literally an abundance of scriptural proof for these things. Look with me at 2 Thessalonians 1, verse 9. Now, these next several verses we're going to look at, I want you to tell me, do these verses teach punishment that lasts for a little bit of time and ceases? Or do they teach punishment that is eternal? What do the verses say? Forget me. 2 Thessalonians 1 verse 9. Who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power? Does that sound like it ends? Matthew 25 verse 46. Matthew 25, Matthew 25 and verse 46. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. Now, if you decide in that verse that the punishment ceases, then to be fair, then eternal life should cease as well. I mean, isn't that what the verse is saying? I'll read it again. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment. That's obviously the lost. But the righteous into life eternal. Well, if you're going to say the punishment isn't everlasting, then guess what for consistency you should say isn't everlasting? You should say life isn't. But guess how long eternal life lasts? Forever. Revelation 14, verse 11. Revelation chapter 14 and verse 11. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. And they have no rest, day nor night, who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Isn't the sense of that that it never ends? Isn't that the most plain, obvious, natural reading of what the verse says? And in case you're confused, it says forever and ever. Mark 8, verse 36. Mark 8, 
Mark chapter 8 and verse 36. Mark 8, 36. For what shall it profit a man if, she, if he shall gain the whole world, and notice this, and lose his own soul? Well, the sense of that verse, listen, if you can keep your soul for eternity, if you get it back, then you didn't really lose it. But what, what Mark 8, 36 is warning about is that what ends up happening to the lost is they lose their own soul. If you get it back, you don't have to worry about losing it. But the fact of the matter is people lose it forever. Get with me Revelation chapter 2, verse 11. Revelation chapter 2, verse 11. I want to spend a few moments talking specifically about the second death. Revelation 2, verse 11. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh... Now notice the language here. Shall not be hurt of the second death. If you didn't know anything else, you know from that verse the second death hurts, don't you? I mean, isn't that the just natural, literal meaning of what it says? Look with me then at Revelation 20, verse 10. Revelation chapter 20 and verse 10. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are. Now I'm going to pause there about the beast and the false prophet. If you read Revelation 19 and Revelation 20, the beast and the false prophet are thrown into the lake of fire before the millennium commences. In other words... If you're thinking, if you're looking at the chart, what happens is the beast and the false prophet, they operate during the 70th week. At the second coming, they are cast into the lake of fire. You can read that at the end of Revelation 19. In Revelation 20, verse 10, what, at the end of the millennium, so it's literally a thousand years later, what the verse says is where the beast and the false prophet are. What does that tell you about annihilation. What does that tell you about cessation? You follow what I'm saying? Annihilation is the idea that what happens is people are obliterated in hell and they cease to suffer because they've been annihilated. They cease to exist. But what Revelation 20 tells you is the beast and false prophet a thousand years after they're cast into the lake of fire, where are they? They're the very same place they were. There was no get out of jail free card. There was no annihilation. There was no cessation. They're in literally the exact same place a thousand years later. And they're no closer to being done with the suffering, are they? Because it lasts forever. Now notice, I'm gonna, I, I stopped in verse 10. Let me read the whole thing. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Some people have the idea that Satan is the king of hell, that he has a throne and he reigns over it. What actually happens? He goes there and he... What, what is the synonym? What, what, the word torment, what is the synonym for that? It's torture. It's not simply suffering. It's torment. It's torture. And what it says there is day and night forever and ever. Look at verse 14. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Now you've already seen that the second death hurts. That was Revelation 2. Revelation 20, verse 10 told you that the second death is, is torment day and night forever and ever. Verse 14, And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life, so the lost of all the ages, was cast into the lake of fire. So what's going to happen to the lost? They're going to be tormented day and night forever and ever. Revelation 21, verse 8, but the fearful and unbelieving 
and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So let me just ask you this. Do people believe that punishment is eternal because of Augustine? Or do people believe hell is eternal because they've actually read the Bible? I mean, what do those verses say? And you realize that a, a King James Bible reads in English the way that the original Greek manuscripts read. That's what it is. That's what preservation means. When God preserved His Word, what He did is He took the original words that He wrote and He preserved them not only in that language, but in other languages. So what you're reading today is the equivalent of what the Apostle Paul wrote. Do people believe punishment is eternal because of Augustine's thinking? Or do they just believe the words on the page? Obviously they believe the words on the page. Let's go to argument number three. The verses about eternal punishment are figurative language. This makes me wonder, do you know what figurative language is? Get John chapter 6, verse 35. John chapter 6 and verse 35. John 6, 35. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. That is figurative language. Jesus Christ was not made of pumpernickel or wheat or rye. When he said he was the bread of life, the very first time you ever read that verse as a child, you knew that that was figurative language, right? Was Jesus of Nazareth saying to people, I am bread, I'm better than home pride, right? No, more nutritious than Wonder Bread. Is that what he was saying? You know that's not what he was saying. You, you understood the first time you read that, that it was figurative language, right? Get with me John 1, verse 29. John chapter 1, verse 29. The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him, and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. That's another example of figurative language, right? Jesus Christ was not a sheep. He didn't have wool, right? He didn't walk around on all fours. The first time you read that verse, you know what you knew it was? You knew it was figurative language because you fully understood that Jesus of Nazareth was fully man, fully God. He was not a sheep. You know, he, he was the figurative lamb of God in that he would pay for man's sins. But you knew that he wasn't literally a lamb. We'll do one more just for fun. 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. And look with me at verse 6. Wherefore, also it is contained in the Scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you therefore which believe he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner, and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense. So Jesus Christ is described as the bread of life, He's described as the Lamb of God. He's described as a cornerstone and a stone of stumbling. And you know good and well that He's not a rock, right? What are, what are the three kinds of rocks? There's only three kinds. Sedimentary, yes. Metamorphic. Okay, the school teacher gets them right. Yeah, that makes sense. There's only three, and He was none of those, right? But he figuratively was the precious cornerstone on which everything else was built, right? He figuratively was the stone of stumbling in that when people rejected him, they stumbled and fell to their own destruction. My point is this. You can tell what figurative language is. It's apparent to you. 
What is figurative about the phrase everlasting destruction? Is that figurative or is that factual? What about everlasting punishment? What about the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever? What about tormented day and night for ever and ever? If you go back and look at all those verses we just looked at, which of those are figurative? And the answer is there's none of them. You can tell when language is figurative because, I mean, I'm, just, I'm not going to explain it further than that. You, you know. And so let me say this. When someone looks at the verses on everlasting destruction or everlasting punishment or tormented day and night forever and ever, and they say that it's figurative language, what they are really saying is, I don't like what those verses say. It's not figurative language. What they're doing is they're just waving their hands at it and saying, well, that's figurative language, so it doesn't count. Anyone who handles the Word of God in that manner should not be trusted. People that do things like that will say that they believe the King James Bible. But if what you do is you deny what the words literally say, then you don't believe it. You just claim to believe it. Look with me at 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1. Second Corinthians 4, verse 1. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. Notice verse 2. But have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness. Now notice this next phrase. Nor handling the word of God deceitfully. Now you can decide for yourself. If the verses say everlasting destruction, everlasting punishment, tormented day and night forever and ever. And you come along and you say, well, yeah, it doesn't really mean that. My opinion, just my personal opinion, you are handling the Word of God deceitfully. And Scripture tells you you hadn't ought to do that. And as members of the body of Christ, we should renounce handling the Word of God deceitfully, shouldn't we? Seems to me that we should. Argument number four. Well, God is a failure if He sends the vast majority of the people He created to hell. So here's what this argument is. God obviously gave life to all mankind, created billions and billions of people. And if most of those people end up in the lake of fire, then God's a failure. I mean, what a dummy. He created the universe, and most people end up lost, so obviously God wouldn't have done that, and God would be a failure if the majority of humanity ended up in hell. So first of all, that's your opinion. There's no verse that says anything like that. But furthermore, God believes in free will. And He believes in free will so strongly that He gives people free will even if they abuse it. Was God aware that Satan was going to rebel? Well, of course, He wasn't surprised at that. Was He aware that a third of the angels would follow Him in that rebellion? He knew all of that. Doesn't mean God's a failure. The fault of Satan's rebellion is on Satan, not God. The reason why God gave free will is that if you don't have free will, you can't love. If I create a robot and I program the robot to say, I love you, David and I press a button, and every time I press the button, it says, I love you, David. 
Is there any actual true love going on? It's just a robot I created that has no free will, has no intelligence, has no ability to make any decision. In order for love to be real, the created being has to have freedom to choose. Well, if you give created beings freedom to choose, the messy reality is some will make bad choices. That doesn't make you a bad creator. It makes you a gracious creator that loves free will. So the, the, the whole argument is just kind of dumb. But beyond that, so follow me on this, it's just wrong to say that the vast majority of souls end up in hell. That's not true. So we're going to do a little... We're going to do a little... Uh, study here. Are you ready? So, let's first look, and uh, you'll see at the top, you can see the web links here, but let's first look here at causes of death. So, let me ask you this. Let's start here. What is the single greatest cause of death on the earth today? That's right. You're skipping ahead. Now, see this causes of death thing? Here's the statistic. Around 56 million people die each year. This is for the whole earth. And I'm just going to scroll down here. And when you look at this chart here, it, okay. So this is from our world in data. The single greatest cause of death that it lists here is cardiovascular disease, essentially heart disease, which it puts at 18.56 million and cancer at 10 million and so on. It adds up to the total, as we saw at the top, of 56 million, okay? But now let's talk about something that we need to talk about, abortion. Now, this is from the World Health Organization, so you know that it's true, right? <laughs> if you're so naive as to believe anything that these folks say, you need to rethink what you're doing. But let's just go with it for now. You ready? Around 73 million induced abortions take place worldwide each year. What was the total number of deaths according to the Our World in Data article? 56. How many died just from abortion? 73. What does that tell you when they're calculating cause of death? They exclude the single greatest cause of death, obviously, don't they? Now, notice what it says here. Six out of ten of all unintended pregnancies and three out of ten of all pregnancies end in induced abortion. Okay? Let's keep going. So, that's, that's abortion. Let's now talk about miscarriage. This article here is from the Mayo Clinic. About 10 to 20 percent of known pregnancies end in miscarriage. The word known there is important because what happens is you can be pregnant and not yet know it. So what this statistic is saying is of known pregnancies, 10 to 20 percent end in miscarriage. Now notice what it says, but the actual number is likely higher because many miscarriages occur very early in pregnancy before you might even know about a pregnancy. The next article I'm going to go to, this is from the March of Dimes. Many of you are familiar with the March of Dimes as a charitable organization. Here is their estimate. As many as half of all pregnancies may end in miscarriage. And that's obviously a lot of them that occur before the, the woman knows that she is pregnant. Okay, we need one more article here. This is again from Our World in Data, and this article is on infant mortality in time past. Now, what's happened in the last 150 years is infant mortality on the earth has significantly declined because of advances in medicine. The infant mortality rates that we have today 
are far, far lower than what they were in time past. This article is an, is an attempt to estimate what did infant mortality look like in time past. So let's jump to the conclusion. And here's the sentence we want. Two estimates that are easy to remember. Around a quarter, 25%, died in the first year of life. Around half died as children before reaching adulthood. So let's add this up. What does this all mean? The vast, vast majority of humanity is saved for the very simple reason they don't live long enough to ever reach the age of accountability. You understand what I'm telling you? So in other words, let's think about this. Miscarriage is 10 to 20% of known pregnancies, but a bunch that occur before that. March of Dimes estimated up to as high as 50% of all. That's just miscarriage. You add to that abortion, which is 30% of known pregnancies, and then what's the historical data on infant mortality? Even if you get, even if you get to birth, you have 25% chance of dying within a year and 50% before adulthood. So the idea that, well, God did a poor job designing the universe because the vast majority of people go to hell is just false. It's just not the way that it works. What happens is the vast majority of humanity ends up in heaven because of God's graciousness in using an age of accountability. Now, with, with all that data, get Matthew 19, verse 14. This is, this is a fascinating verse. You've probably had this experience. You read a verse and you realize, wow, I've read that verse for 25 years and I had no idea what it meant. I thought I knew what it meant, but I didn't have an idea what I was talking about. Look at Matthew 19, verse 14. But Jesus said, Suffer little children and forbid them not to come unto me, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. You know what the kingdom of heaven is chock full of? Children! Billions and billions and billions of children. Which praise the Lord for that. So the argument that God is a failure because the vast majority of humanity goes to hell, is wrong on so many levels. It's like, a, it's like a confused person in an elevator. They're wrong on many levels. <laughs> that was a good one. Come on now. <laughs> work, work with me, right? The arguments in support of universalism are wrong. They handle the Word of God deceitfully, and they just don't make any, make any sense. So let's go to the second section. Heresies must exist, and they re reveal who is approved and who is not. So let's start here. Universalism is a false gospel, right? I mean, universalism is not arguing about whether Paul's the 13th apostle. The teaching of universalism is a false gospel, and it is a wicked act. Now, am I exaggerating? Is it okay to tell lost people that they're actually, it's going to work out all right? Th that is a horribly wicked thing to do. Telling someone that is going to spend eternity in the lake of fire, tormented day and night, forever and ever, and telling them it's all going to work out fine, that, that's an evil act. There's, there's no getting around that. Get with me 1 Timothy 4, verse 1. First Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Universalism is a departure from the faith. And it's a doctrine of devils because it's a corruption and a denial of the gospel. What did Paul say 
as to how you should think about people that teach a different gospel. Get Galatians 1 verse 8. Galatians 1 verse 8. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again. This is repeated for emphasis. If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. So what Paul plainly says there is someone who is preaching a false gospel should be accursed. Well, let me ask you this. Does a saved person who preaches a false gospel, do they lose their salvation? They don't. But do they suffer consequences at the judgment seat of Christ? They do. Now, I'll just say this. We realize that some people who teach universalism, they also teach that the judgment seat of Christ doesn't exist. And I'm just, I'm just going to go ahead and tell you the truth. Now, what happens in life, a lot of people can't handle the truth, so there's going to be a lot of drama that follows from this. And, you know, just going to be the way that it is. But here's the truth. The simple truth is this. People, even saved people, have guilty consciences and they don't want to give account. The reason why people want to get rid of the judgment seat of Christ is at the judgment seat of Christ, you know this from Romans 14, 12, every one of us will give account of ourselves to God. I don't look forward to that. I mean, I don't. Because there's all sorts of things in my life that aren't the way they should be. Unkind words I've spoken, bad attitudes, evil thoughts. I don't look forward to the judgment seat of Christ. But the fact that I don't look forward to it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. I'll, I'll, let me go on from this. I've had people who deny the judgment seat of Christ exists. They say it doesn't exist. They've sent me emails telling me that I'm going to give account to God for how I've mistreated them. The theological term for that is making stuff up. In other words, the judgment seat of Christ doesn't exist, except it does in this instance because I want it to. You shouldn't handle the Word of God that way. Either the judgment seat of Christ exists or it doesn't, but it doesn't exist according to your convenience for whatever agenda you have. That's just dishonesty. By the way, if you're willing to rest the Scriptures to get rid of the judgment seat of Christ, to get rid of that judgment, you might just also rest them to get rid of the great white throne judgment. Because people don't like judgment. And I get it. As a guilty person, you don't look forward to judgment. But it's the same thing as a six-year-old when you mocked your sibling by putting your fingers in your ears saying, I can't hear you, I can't hear you. <laughs> it's shenanigans. Pretending that eternal judgment doesn't exist is like pretending gravity doesn't exist. It's all fun and games until you fall off a ladder. Then what happens? Well, you cannot believe gravity as much as you want. But guess what? It's not going to prevent gravity from operating. Now, here's the thing. Here's the thing. This will get sorted out at the judgment seat of Christ. So, in other words... If you're preaching universalism and you're a saved person, you're going to answer for that. 
You may like to think you're not going to. You can pretend you're not going to, but you will. And so it's going to get sorted out there. But here's the real problem. This is the part that irks me. Well, there's a lot that irks me. It'll be too late for the fools that believed you. One of the things that happens is this. People depart the faith into doctrines of devils. It just happens. And so there are mid acts people where one of the things that mid acts people do from time to time, and it's not the Holy Spirit, it's their flesh, is they depart into Acts 28 or similar positions. And then what they do is they teach universalism. There's a number of grace people where they depart mid acts truth and then they teach universalism. Well, if you're a saved person and you teach universalism, you don't lose your salvation. Your rewards suffer. But the lost people that you teach universalism to that believe it, they end up in hell. They end up in the lake of fire. And so teaching universalism is not a victimless crime. There's no way to undo that. Now I'm going to say something further on this. Grace preachers who abandon the faith and teach universalism believed the correct gospel when it came to their own soul, but are teaching a different gospel when it pertains to someone else's soul. I'm going to say that again, and it's true. A grace teacher... So someone that's in the body of Christ. They believed the correct gospel when it came to their own soul. That's what got them saved. But now they're teaching a different gospel to other people. You know what that's like? That's like the government officials that tell you, you shouldn't travel at Thanksgiving. I'm going to. You shouldn't. But I'm going to. The hair salons are all closed for you little people, but it needs to be open because I need a haircut. You see that hypocrisy in little governmental tyrants all the time, and you know what it is, right? You, you know it when you see it. It's hypocrisy. It's corruption. It's one set of rules for you little people and a different set of rules for me. And that is a wicked thing. Make no mistake about that. And by the way, the people that do that will give account for that. Well, it's the same thing when saved people teach universalism. That's, what not, that's not what they believe to get saved. The way they got saved is they believe the gospel of Christ, that Jesus Christ died for their sins, was buried, and resurrected. They believe that He was the Son of God and He paid the full price for their sins. They didn't believe any sort of universal foolishness. That wouldn't have saved them. They believed the correct gospel. But now they're giving themselves over to their flesh, and they're teaching universalism. And anyone that is foolish enough to believe it, you'll end up in the lake of fire if you're not saved. And they're not going to be with you. Now, if that doesn't bother you, it should. First Corinthians 11, verse 19. First Corinthians 11, verse 19. For there must be also heresies among you, so are heresies always going to exist? They have to. For what reason? That they which are approved may be made manifest among you. That right there is the test. How can you tell if a preacher or a teacher is approved? Now, what's the cross-reference on approved there? Yes, study to show thyself Approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. What every member of the body of Christ should desire 
is they should desire to be approved at the judgment seat of Christ. That when their work is evaluated, the Lord Jesus Christ evaluates it, and He says, that's gold, silver, and precious stones. That work abides the fire, and you receive a reward. Your work is approved. Every member of the body of Christ should desire that to be the case. Well, how do you, how do you, how do you as a member of the body of Christ, when you're thinking about, well, who should I allow to teach me? Not that you believe everything they say, but at least you allow them to teach you because you think they might have something to say. Well, one of the things you should figure out is, who among you are approved? How can you tell? Well, 1 Corinthians eleven nineteen 19 is the test. Heresies make known who is approved and who is not approved. So, let's try it out. If someone is teaching universalism, do they fit in the approved category or the not approved category? Not, and it's not even close. So what heresies do is they are very helpful to you as a member of the body of Christ. Because when you see a teacher or a group teaching a heresy, what should you do? You should avoid it, right? You should not have anything to do with it. You should not support it. So let me say this. What is your final authority? Is it the Word of God or is it a man? And I'll give you an example that I see all the time. What will happen is people will, will grow up in a church and it will be a church that they were raised in or they were confirmed in. And it could be a church that their parents went to or their grandparents went to or their parents helped found. And so they'll say, well, this is my church. So this is where I'm going to stay. If that church fails to teach the truth, you shouldn't stay there no matter what your emotions tell you. I mean, you may have a sentimental attachment. You may have a historical relationship. But at the point where the church refuses to teach the truth and teaches error, what should you do? Yeah, either get them to correct it or leave. Because your ultimate loyalty should be to the Lord Jesus Christ who bought your soul, not a man-made institution. But what I find all the time is people say, well, I've been in this group for a while. I've listened to this person for a long time, so I'm going to continue to. Well, then you're following a man. Don't, don't, you, you can pretend like it's faithfulness to the Word of God, but it's not. Because at the point when people are teaching heresies, they're not approved. Get with me 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3. Second Timothy chapter 4, verse 3. And I'm going to tell you this is where we are. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. People are like, I don't want the truth. But after their own lust, they shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. See, 2 Timothy 4 tells you exactly what a lot of heretical teaching is like. It's fables. You know what fables are? They're made up stories. Now what happens is people like to tell all kinds of unscriptural stories. They like to appeal to your emotions. They play upon your feelings. But what they end up doing is when they deny the plain words on the page, where it says everlasting destruction, they say, well, it doesn't really mean that. It says torment, day and night, forever. Well, it actually means it stops after a while. You need to recognize that for what it is. But he itches my ears and they feel so good. Right? You know this, right? If you, you, I can't believe I'm doing this. But you know when you're petting the dog and you it scratch them behind the ears and they just love that and it feels so good? Are you like that? Where if someone just scratches your ears the right way, you're like, oh, this is so good. I'm just going to stay here all day. You have to be better than that. Right? I mean, you're not a lap dog, are you? It's 
strange world. Hebrews 5. Look at Hebrews 5, verse 12. For when for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age. Now notice this. Even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. What you need to be as a believer is you need to be mature. You need, you need to be able to handle strong meat. And what that tells you is your spiritual senses, what do you need to do? You have to use them. Notice what it says there. Who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. What goes on on the earth is there's all kinds of heresies and lies and false teaching. How do you protect yourself against that? Well, you have spiritual senses that you have to use. And you use that by studying the Word of God and studying the Word of God and searching. So, for example, I've given you a whole bunch of verses today. I've suggested to you that universalism is a big bunch of nonsense, that it's actually a wicked false gospel. Don't believe a thing I said. Why should you trust me? Don't trust me. Look at all those verses, run all those cross-references, and see what you find. Now, what I'm going to predict, because I have the gift of prophecy, I don't, but I'll just go ahead and say this. There's no one that came to the Bible with an honest heart and searched the verses and said, hell doesn't last very long. It's not there. And the reason I know it's not there is there's verse after verse after verse that tells you how long it lasts. And it doesn't end. So my encouragement to you is this. With this teaching, as with all teachings, search these things out. Spend the time, spend the hours to get to the answer. And when you get to the answer and you realize what it is, which, spoiler, the lake of fire lasts forever. When people teach the lake of fire doesn't last forever, you know, make your own decision. Scripture would tell you you hadn't, be, hadn't ought to be involved with people teaching a false gospel. That's just a foolish thing to do. How is that... Can you, can you recommend to your friends a channel that teaches that lost people are okay? Would you want that on your conscience? I, it's already tragic how many lost people are going to be in hell. Don't make it worse by recommending something that says, oh, it's all right. Don't worry about it. Don't sweat it. Come on, folks. Christ died for our sins. He deserves our allegiance and our loyalty. And we need to be faithful to the gospel that saves people. Eternity is too important to play games. Amen. Father God, thank you for the gospel. We thank you that we are saved by grace. We thank you that Jesus Christ paid the full penalty for our sins. We thank you that we can have eternal life as a free gift. Help us to be faithful in preaching the right gospel and in standing for the truth. We pray these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's sing, folks.